I don't know if you saw the statement by Sajid Javid yesterday on on uh, COVID nineteen. I, I missed it actually. I was I was out, funnily enough, in Whitehall uh, trying to drum up some business in the Red Line. <clears throat> well, <laughs> well, well done. You're you're doing your bit. I was. Um, well, I, 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 unfortunately, unfortunately, I wasn't in the Red Line, Mike. I was in the in the debate right. in the statement, and uh, the facts are. Your, your listeners need to know that uh, as a virus evolves, it becomes more transmissible and, and less pathogenic, yes. less lethal, right. uh, less damaging. Um, and the figures are uh, of the 336 confirmed cases of the Omicron variant in the UK, which will not be every single person who's got it. Uh, the, the very round number of zero people have been hospitalised as a yes. result of this i did see um, i did see desmond swain's question and the answer to it yes and i followed that up by by saying to uh, pointing out again to the secretary of state that the virus has evolved to be more transmissible and less, less pathogenic mm. you've already conceded that none of the 360 336 confirmed cases have actually been hospitalized in the uk um, and uh, this is really good news i mean Quite honestly, the faster that the Omicron variant becomes the dominant variant around the world, mm. uh, the better for uh, for us all, because the only variant then that can knock that off its prominent position will be one that's even more transmissible and even less yes. um, pathogenic than the, the Omicron. Because, this is because going to evolve, I'm evolve over I'm, the time. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm assuming that the, the direction of travel in, in virus is always the same way. It doesn't suddenly come back and be more more more, more horrible. And no, more... because it's it's about transmissibility. The yeah. transmissibility is the key, and, and it sacrifices uh, its pathogenicity for for transmissibility. And mm. the only one then that can be can beat it will be one that's more transmissible, and, and that will be less lethal. Yes. So it, eventually it will be the common cold. Mm. Uh, I do worry that uh, the, the only pandemic we're actually suffering from now is a pandemic of fear. Well, that's right. I mean, I was listening to somebody talking to Julie Hartley Brewer this morning who talked about people being frightened to go out. And that's why some of them haven't gone back to work. And I'm thinking, what exactly are you frightened of? You know, and I don't well, buy well, it. I think, I think people are using it as an excuse. Well, I think, I mean, I've always been a big supporter of the nudge department in government in mm. number 10. But I think the nudge department's been working overtime during this uh, pandemic. It realises that the power it can have over people by creating fear. And it, it's far easier to to scare people into compliance yeah. than it is to sit down and explain to them the uh, the risks that they, they may or may not be, be running. And mm. I think the... I think the nudge department has turned into the shove department. Yeah. And, I, and I don't like being shoved about, like, quite honestly. Well, well most um, people don't, I don't think. And that's the part of the problem. I mean, the travel restrictions at the moment, to me, are completely and utterly unnecessary, completely ludicrous. But they forced me, unfortunately, um, to cancel my trip to America because I just can't risk what it is that they're telling me might happen. Not because I'm worried about the disease, but because I'm worried about the restrictions. And you're having the hospitality industry. People are cancelling Christmas parties between now and and uh, 25th uh, because of fear of the omicron variant which is being ramped up in the press and i noticed this morning all the negatives that sajid javid spoke about about it you know the the omicron variant's going to double in numbers infections yeah. every, every two days it could be more transmissible uh, it may be transmissible at an earlier stage mm. of infection than other variants they all mention that but none of them mention the fact that no one's being hospitalised right. because of it. Um, so, you know, the sooner this uh, this evolves into being a snivel that we get every winter, uh, the sooner we can get back right. back to normal. If getting back to normal is what people really want to do. Well, I think certainly many people do. I, I fear that there are some people who don't want to get back to normal, and those are the people that you sometimes see talking on uh, media outlets about how dangerous things are and how we have to be careful. And how we, you know, some of these scientists who seem obsessed uh, with eliminating all risk from your life, which is a completely ridiculous idea. Well, I, 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 saw, I saw some figures for the Delta variant, right. um, which is the dominant variant at the moment in the UK. The average age of mortality with the, um, with the um, Delta variant currently, it was 85, if you're va double vaccinated, it's 85 years of age with right. five comorbidities. So mm. you've got five other things that are killing you. Yeah. And if you're not vaccinated, it's 79 with four of the comorbidities yeah. killing you. It's complete nonsense. But it's always been the case, Andrew, that the numbers of people dying have been very largely 
over the age of 82 and ne generally speaking uh, vulnerable in some other way you know there is no truth to anybody's um uh, instructions uh, which which suggests that anybody by and large healthy by and large under the age of 82 is actually going to be affected fatally by this it's just not happening and and we and we you know the government have been pushing and the department of health pushing very hard to uh, to get children vaccinated when unless they've got underlying health problems mm. they're absolutely at no risk whatsoever I know. from uh, from this from this variant or any of the other variants and in fact the figures i'm seeing for young people uh, specifically you've got no risk of uh, of of, um, of of harm from from covid mm. is that uh, you're 13, someone who's been naturally infected with COVID is 13 times less likely to be reinfected than someone who's double jabbed mm. getting it for the first time. Yeah. The, the, the natural protection, the herd immunity we're going to get in young people uh, is, is is what's saving us at the moment. I yeah, think. that's right. I mean, and also a lot of the, the, the increase in infections is amongst young people because they keep testing kids in school continually. Um, but I'm also hearing from people that schools uh, that their kids are going to are already threatening them that they might have to shut because they've got so much COVID. And you go, well, why? You know, none well, of the kids, well, the none of the the kids are actually the sick. And and the restrictions, I, I've, I've had some very disappointing news from my constituency that uh, the restrictions are being gold-plated. So we've got children in school now who have been told to wear masks in the corridors, but not in the classroom. Yeah. And, and then plenty of schools in my constituency are now... Uh, extending that to wearing masks in the playground when they're outside. Um, I mean, the damage we're doing to our young people, and we're scaring everyone to death. I mean, it really is incredible, isn't it, that you thought, I mean, just before this variant was discovered in South Africa, where I understand also nobody there has been sent to hospital as a result of getting this uh, this Omicron variant anyway. Um, but just before that was discovered, it felt almost as though we were out of it, didn't it? It felt as though people were talking about other things. Boris Johnson was talking about other issues, getting on with, you know, running the economy, running the country, getting on with making the recovery work and all of that. And then suddenly we feel as if we're all back to square one. And I actually feel personally um, worse about what we're doing than I have for a very long time, because I felt I f it feels as though they're just deliberately hanging in there because they want it to go on. Um, well, I think you're going to have some very good news. I think probably next Tuesday or Wednesday, the Prime Minister is going to announce that we can have Christmas. That's very nice of him. Um, and that um, the Omicron variant is is not dangerous and we're going to have to live with it. Mm. Uh, but of course, you know, if the Labour Party were running this country now, we'd never have been out of lockdown in the summer. No, uh, we wouldn't have built up that herd immunity of natural infection in the young people. Um, that, that, that's, that's helping us now immensely uh, and we'd be in the same state as most the yeah. most of rest no, of Europe listen, I, I going get, back into lockdown I get that you, you won't hear me saying I wish we had Keir Starmer running the country you'll never hear me saying that and if you ever do hear me <laughs> saying that you'll know that I've had one too many in the red you've line you've lost it <laughs> yeah you, you just take me out and shoot me you know but here's the thing Boris needs to show his leadership now. He, he, this is when we need it. This is, you know, this is the absolute crucial point. My my conversation with um, with Simon Cawley yesterday from the Independent, the travel guy, he said that the, the announcement that was going to come on the 18th is now going to be the 20th, which is when I understand he's going to make the a pronouncement about Christmas. But if you say it's Tuesday, that's news to me. If that if that's a hard and fast Tuesday, no, um, I think I think I think he'll make a. a um... Well, I, I already raised when they brought the restrictions in right. that, uh, you know, it, we can't have uh, further restrictions, <clears throat> if necessary, brought in after Parliament's risen for the Christmas recess. We'd have to come back. Mm. These are very important issues. Mm. If, if, the, if the government are contemplating cancelling Christmas, yeah. we've got to come back. I'm quite happy if they want to lift all the restrictions to announce that when we're not sitting, then we go back to the status quo. Um but, I mean, we, we don't have government by dictat. But the most onerous restrictions, Andrew, are not so much the mask wearing in shops and on public transport. Um, it's more about the travel restrictions. And an awful lot of people have now cancelled or will cancel this week their plans to go anywhere. And an awful lot of those people are not going on holiday. They're going to see their families. They're going to see people that live abroad uh, who are their loved ones. Um, and it's very, very difficult for an awful lot of them. And I include myself in it. I don't pretend that it's not about me. Um I don't, you know, I don't really at the moment feel I have a choice. I can't go to America because the restrictions are too onerous and it could potentially cost me an awful lot of money if somebody tests positive while we're abroad. It's the direction of travel, Mike, and I've got a personal vested interest because I've got a East Midlands airport in my constituency of North West Leicestershire and it employs about 8,500 uh, 
local people. Yeah. Uh, and clearly, it's the uncertainty. I'm speaking to people. They can they could probably wear the testing. It's an extra burden of cost uh, if they've booked. But what they're worried about is that the the direction of travel. And if it gets any worse, they won't be able to come back. They'll get right. stuck. They may have to quarantine. Uh, and it's that uncertainty which has uh, has bedeviled yeah. the travel industry. And it's it's a big step back when. Uh, if actually, if you follow the science, and I'm sure it'll be vindicated next week when the, the figures come out, that um, <clears throat> this latest variant is actually a move in the right direction for, for the UK and the world, less uh, more transmissible, less lethal, and that's the right. direction of travel we be going in. Well, I'm, I'm sure you're right, but I'm not sure you're right about the timing, because I don't think you can sit there now, Andrew, and tell me that by next Tuesday, all of this will disappear in terms of the restrictions. Well, I'm hoping so. The uh, I know that um, a week last Sunday, the uh, samples of the variant were delivered to Port and Down for testing right. for uh, if they could bypass the vaccines and uh, the pathogenicity of the uh, of the uh, of the variant. So I, I would expect that we should have those those figures very shortly. Right. OK. Well, now you've hurled me back into doubt and, and you know, um, uncertainty because I was pretty much there when I said, look, I'm not doing it just not going so now you're telling me wait till tuesday and see what happens well i'm i'm it, it, i don't think there's any scientific basis for this tightening of restrictions well neither do i but it doesn't mean they're not going to doesn't mean they're going to lift them though does it um I, I think that the weight of evidence um and the reassurance that the scientists will be able to give the government um i think um there'll be a bit of a backbench rebellion if we don't uh, if the science comes out and we don't get back to normal then you have to ask the question, why are we doing it? Yeah, well, I've been asking that question for about a year. 